Hi everybody, my name is Sharon Loudon and I'm so thrilled to be here with you. Thank you Claudio and everybody at Art Basel for having us today. It's exciting to be here in this dynamic environment. Uh, I am the, I'm an artist, I'm the editor of Living and Sustaining Creative Life and that's what this, uh, this event is centered around today. So before I get started and talk a little bit about the book, I'd love to introduce to you some amazing people here I have right next to me. I feel so honored to be with these great people. So all the way to the left, I have Shumi Momin, who is the co-founder, director, and curator of Land, which is the Los Angeles Nomadic Division, a nonprofit art organization that started in 2009. A former curator of the Whitney at Museum of American Art, she co-curated the Whitney Biennial in 2004 and in 2008, and has organized solo shows of many artists, including Terrence Co., Evie Day, Mark Radford, Andrea Zatel, Banks Violet, and Ellen Harvey, who's also here with us today. That was in 2003. Um, to the right of Shanine is Ellen Harvey. She's an artist who lives and works in Brooklyn. Ellen's work spans from paintings to sculptures to permanent public art projects as well. She's recently had a solo exhibition of her work at the Corkin Gallery in Washington, D.C. And in 2014, she's going to have a solo exhibition at Groninger Museum in Bruges. You can find her work here as she's showing at the Mason de Clerc Gallery, which is from Brussels, Belgium. And her work is also represented by Dodge Gallery in New York City. So if you don't get a chance to see it here, you can see it there in New York. And then finally, Brian Toll, who's here to the left of me, is an artist who lives in New York and just recently relocated to the studio where he bought a church, very interesting, in the town of Roxbury, New York. Brian has shown his installation, sculptures in galleries, museums, and in the public realm, and is known for his fantastic Irish Hunger Memorial, which is located in Battery Park City in Lower Manhattan, which is really profound. Um, his work is represented, um, who's here, is CRG Gallery, galleries here, and that is from New York City. So anyway, I, I, we are here, and thank you all very, very much for being here. What a pleasure to be with you. Um, so we're here to talk about Living and Sustaining Creative Life, which is a book that I edited. Two and a half years ago, I was asked to, to write a book, and as an artist, I didn't feel like I could you know, offer anything other than uh, to talk about my own work, and I thought, oh, I'm just not going to write a book about that. So I, I thought, what could be most useful, but also what could be a great source of generating community and embracing community? So when I got out of school, I had a tremendous amount of debt. I graduated from uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago and then Yale University. And I thought, at that time, many years ago, I didn't have a community that really gave me the advice or tools or shared with me anything about money. And still to this day, I find that a lot of artists don't have a lot of exchange about how they make a living and what sustains them. And I, I, I see a lot of books on the shelves about artists' work and uh, how they think and how they um, think creatively. Um, but I, I don't, I didn't see, I haven't seen any books about how do they really live? You know, what are the mechanics about and the keys of sustaining a creative life? Um, so I put together this book of 40 uh, essays by 40 working artists. 19 of them are from New York City, 19 of them are from the rest of the country, and two people are from Europe, ages 30 to 66. I wanted to have a big range. Some of the essays are, are you know, they're opaque, and they start a conversation, and some of the essays are very transparent, and they sort of end a conversation, and a complete conversation. And the, uh, the essays range because of the personality of the artist, um, and I think there's a lot of information in this book. So I'm going to start by asking these guys here uh, to talk about, you know, what are the keys to, or some elements of how an artist sustains their creative life. So why don't we get started, Brian, do you want to start with that? I would love for you to talk about yourself and what are the mechanics for you and how you juggle everything and how you uh, sustain your creativity? Hi, everybody. I am... Um I think that artists come to art from different places, and I think it's very difficult to define one way of, of finding a path to, 
sustainability um, and creativity. I didn't start life as an artist, or maybe I did, but at some point I forgot that I was one. And I got involved um, in political science. My first degree is in political science. I had a very, very um, politically active grandmother who was hell-bent on having one of her 18 grandchildren turn into the governor of New York State. <laughs> and so I figured nobody else took her up on it. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And so I went to school for political science and worked in the state legislature for two years as a full-time intern. And I found myself... I, I found myself... <laughs> I found myself... <laughs> decompressing at night by, by thinking about art and making drawings. And not really knowing that that was the direction that I was going to go in. And as fate had it, I was dating a guy at the time um, who was studying art history, got into Columbia, and moved with him to New York, and bit by bit began to pursue the art more seriously. I went back to night school at Parsons School of Design, was encouraged to go back to school full time, and by the time I was, I guess, about 28, 29 years old, I graduated from Yale with an MFA. Um, what I wasn't fully aware of was how much influence or how much my previous education would have over my ability to work in the public realm, for example. You know, I built one of the largest sculptures in New York City. It's a seven and a half million dollar project, a half an acre sculpture in Lower Manhattan, about a very politically charged subject, hunger. And I think if it hadn't been for the fact that I had studied politics, I'd worked with state uh, legislators, that I was really able to maintain my ability to think about this enormous subject, honor it, but also deal with all the political, economic, bureaucratic um, pressures that were being put upon me. And so I'm actually quite grateful for the fact that I started off in this very di different direction, only to be better prepared for what would become my career. But can you just say really briefly, what are those keys to you right now that sustain your creative life right now? Like, what are the, what's the nitty gritty? Just, just the, the nuggets, if you can just briefly state that, just briefly. Well, one of the things that I say in my essay is that I think that um, consistency is overrated, at least in terms of my pursuits. <laughs> and one of the things that I think characterizes my career is that I've made very few exhibitions or, or public works that look anything like the previous work. There's no aesthetic consistency. Of course, there's a, a conceptual approach to the way that I make my work, um, but it, it takes a little bit of effort to find that thread, uh, to pursue that thread. Um, the other thing that I would say is, is I'm a huge believer in serendipity. Um, there have been so many things that have happened in my life, like that political science degree, for example, uh, that, that, that very, very insistent grandmother. But also, for example, I got the job for the Irish Hunger Memorial because I happened to be serving on jury duty. I was sequestered for two weeks on a federal drug case, and I happened to sit next to the son of a, an art administrator who happened to be the person who was hired to select the artist for the Irish Hunger Memorial. And um, I got a phone call on a Wednesday saying, hey, Brian, I like your work. I'm not quite sure um, you know, whether or not you're prepared to put together a package in two days. This is 1999. We were still working with slides. I was a sole proprietor, and I mean in the, in the most fundamental sense. And I had to scramble to get the dupes, get the statement, deliver the package myself, only to find out that I was one of five finalists um, and eventually won the competition. But if I had not gone to jury duty, had I postponed it like I should have, <laughs> like most of us do, <laughs> I wouldn't have built that project and I probably wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> That's awesome. Ellen? I think the question of how you sustain yourself, um, obviously, I mean, we're in the middle of an art fair, so obviously part of how you sustain yourself is, 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 is an economic question. Like how do you pay the rent? Um, and that is, of course, I, you know, I would never downplay that. But I think as an artist, if you're actually um, motivated by that, first of all, you're a fool. 
because you know there's a lot uh, better ways to be um, economically stable. Um, but also, you're going to be a very unhappy artist, and you're going to not be a very good artist. I think that in a way, the decisions that you make within the realms, obviously, of some practicality, have to become from the thing that made you want to be an artist in the first place. So for me, that's very much about wanting to be part of a conversation. Like I really want to make experiences for people that sort of seduce them into thinking in a different way. And I'm interested in reaching as large an audience as possible. So as a result, I mean, obviously, it's wonderful to show an affair because you have this sort of massive audience that sees a piece, even if it is under very quite, quite difficult sort of circumstances. I mean, you can feel a bit like your brain has turned to art porridge by the time you've made it through everything. Um, but I think also um, it's, it's, it's driven me to work not just in galleries, but also do museum commissions and to do a lot of public work as well. I really enjoy reaching out to different audiences. And interestingly enough, even though at the beginning of my career this often seemed like a very foolish choice, and I thought I could often have shown up wearing a kind of sponsored by MasterCard t-shirt, you know, like some kind of race car driver, because it really was, you know, everything was on my credit card. Um, it has ended up meaning that um, you know, I've not only managed to talk to different audiences by projects that you know, I went out into the streets and did legal projects, which then led to other kind of more commissioned projects. Um, it basically meant that um, I ended up being not dependent on one part of the art world, and that's been really great for me. I really enjoyed that. It gives me a great deal of you know, freedom and flexibility. And a lot of that just comes from initially just saying, well, you know, I really want to do something that is a public artwork, and yet no one's going to hire me, no one's going to ask me, so I'm just going to go out and do it illegally on the streets on my own. So for me, paradoxically, kind of not thinking about how to support myself, in the end, thank God, I was very lucky um, to work out. Shani, what are your observations? I think it's on. It's on, okay. Um, I'm going to take a question a little bit more literally because, um, can I ask you a question? Oh, sorry. 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 What are the things that, and, and you and I spoke about this the other day um, in discussing this panel, when I was, before I was involved with Art World, when I was very young, um, one of my favorite things to do was driving in the car. We lived in the country, so to go to New York City and do anything we did, we had to drive a fair bit of time. And, Along the way, one of my favorite games was to try to see really quickly into houses as I went by them. And then in between the next that house and the next house, to try to imagine uh, who was that person that I saw and what did they do every day and how did they function. So, you know, if I had a glimpse of um, the, the teenager's bedroom and their pink wallpaper and the poster that they loved and maybe the, the dress they had on their bed, would, I would create like this story about how they existed in the world, what they did when they got up. I was at that time, and still to this day, utterly fascinated with the literal day-to-day -day of how people create their lives and how they construct the narratives that they want to live. And I think that when I then, you know, later, uh, once I became a curator and, and, and a curator of contemporary art in particular, and specifically even more so working with artists um, on new projects, on commission projects that often took forms that weren't comfortable within a standard gallery or even museum setting, even though at that, at that time it was at a museum, but still formats that um, felt more like living their work or kind of creating their work in the process of their creative existence. Um, I realized that in, a, in an odd way, what I found most fascinating about that process in a, what I hope is slightly more sophisticated level than when I was eight years old and looking at people's windows, but having, at least, having that kind of access to the way in which those ideas evolved, and um, not just literally in a scholarly way, which of course I embrace in other parts of the way I work, but the thing that that felt the most resonant to me in understanding uh, the projects and the artists that I was working with, Ellen, uh, um, as Sharon has mentioned, being one of them, um, was this access to being in their place, being in that the thing I used to look in that window, being actually in there and understanding how her day was working to make this idea that we were discussing happen. And quite often, you know, to me the the process of the studio visit was a little bit about talking around the actual thing that we were doing. Um, 
a little bit at the end of the day, much like the book, where if we're talking about how, what are all these things that you do in your day to day that ostensibly are the construct that makes the creativity possible, but to me are in fact the material of, of the creative life. And, um, you know, that is the axis, I think, you know, again, to, to point to that book and, and some others that have come out recently, that to me is the most, um, you know, I, I was calling it the other day at dinner the banalities of genius. I mean, I think it's those, those literal aspects of what Ellen had in her bookcase and on that street visit and what she had, you know, written down on the wall or she made her notes or just what she was eating every day, like her routine to get her mind in. <laughs> Seriously though, to get your mind in gear when you had your coffee in the morning at what point you needed a vodka. Like we, I mean, seriously, these were, nice. these are yeah, very, very catchy <laughs> <point. laughs> Well, given that you slept about two hours a night, that whole process, I think that's fair. But in any case, I know it sounds a little bit glib, but I really don't think that it is. And that's the point that I want to make is that those, those uh, specificities and the access that I had to those specificities is what I think allowed, uh, really inspired my curatorial life and what I would look, wanted to try to convey about the artistic pro creative process, um, in this case the visual arts, but just in general I find fascinating. And um, that that's the opportunity I would like to give, or I hope to give some access to through the public art projects that we do as part of land and maybe even part of the Whitney things that we did before, um, to understand it as like a means of living, not just an object or a thing or one last presentation. So, okay. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Um, I, I forgot to mention that the format of this is we're, we're going to talk for a little bit more and then I'm going to open it up to questions for you guys so you can ask these guys questions. Um, so I just want to go on to ask this important question. This event is a part of a book tour. It's actually a part of a 45 stop book tour until 2015. The book has just exploded. And I think it's because a lot of people want to know how artists live and how they sustain their creative practice and their life. But inevitably, at almost every, uh, I've done about 10 events, and almost every event, someone in the audience asks something that pertains to success of an artist. And the book itself, after reading through the essays, you can probably assess for yourself what is the meaning for, of success for an artist and what, is, what does that mean for you if you're an artist in the audience or do anything creative in your life. And so I want to ask um, Shamim and Ellen and Brian, I want to ask them, you know, we're here at this art fair with so much money trading and exposure and glamour and uh, a, a lot of s spectacular. And, uh, you know, I, in this setting, it would be amazing to talk about you know, what does success mean to you, or is this or not a measure of success? And uh, then, you know, it calls to question, is success only a measure of economics or in the marketplace? And so we'll just go down again, and Brian, if you'd like to just um, answer, briefly answer what you think about that. It's a tricky one. Yes, he had the question before. No, I, I, yes, <laughs> and I have pondered it. And I, <laughs> I don't know how much closer I am to being able to answer it. I think I'd like to respond to what Ellen was saying earlier about um, economics and how, how we support ourselves as artists. And I, I really do think that it's a practical concern that as a young emerging artist, it was the last thing on my mind. I mean, I knew that I had to pay the rent. I knew that I had to eat. I knew that I had to get things done. I had to be somewhat responsible. But the bottom line for me was always getting to the studio and always getting the work done. And so success meant finishing the piece. You know, success meant achieving the, you know, the goal, whatever it was. And every time we make things, if we are in fact successful, it opens an opportunity to make something else. And so success is the ability, for me, is the ability to continue to do the thing that I love to do. It sounds like a cliche, but that's really what it's about. And sometimes we make money and sometimes we spend more than we should. <laughs> and um, you know, sometimes these large, seemingly large scale public projects seem very, very lucrative, but they almost always break the bank. <laughs> so um, just the ability to continue to do it and think 
and engage with other people who are passionate about this thing that we do. This, this thing, the thing is, success in the art world, if it's, if it's, if art in itself is an imaginary, has an imaginary value, right? We have to accept the fact that these things are not intrinsically, unless it's encrusted with diamonds, you know? We all know what that's about. But for the most part, a, a piece of canvas and a, and a, and a, a box of paints or some Sculpey, there isn't all that much money in that, but somehow we transform it in such a way that numbers of people, in some cases large numbers of people, believe that this thing is incredibly important and therefore valuable to us. And, and that's an amazing thing to be a participant in. Well, I mean, you can pause that stone in my, my answer. <laughs> <laughs> you passed it. <laughs> But um, it's true, it's true though, it's my answer. My answer is very similar, which is that my metric of success is very much the ability to do the next piece. The ability to you know, finish the piece and then make the next thing. But I think in a larger way, what I, am, what I see as being successful is um, being part of a larger narrative, and the same way that I'm, that you know, is interested in projects that don't necessarily they kind of become part of other people's narrative, become part of other people's experiences. That's something that's extremely important for me. And the piece that I do that I care about and I think works um, is one where unexpectedly people will come up to me and have this experience that they would never have had if not for me. The show that I did at the corporate, which kind of imagined aliens um, becoming fans of neoclassical architecture, what was extraordinary was getting kind of emails from people who had taken the aliens' guide, this sort of map, to these ruins of Washington, D.C., and had actually gone around and tried to find things, and then people were commissioned to kind of make cocktails in response to the whole thing. Um, and things like that sort of that is really what makes me happy because I feel like I've made something where somebody else experienced something that they wouldn't have experienced without me. And I like, I don't like this idea of being an artist as being a kind of defensive posture where you're an artist and somebody else is not an artist. I actually think that a lot of very interesting things, very interesting things happen in this sort of liminal space between art and non-art. And I'm very interested in the idea that People who experience the work that I make, they create the work. They're not just, you know, they're not just passive consumers of this, you know, object or experience that I've made. So to me, success is when things starts to come back. I think the point at which I felt that I became a real artist was when I stopped making work that was just for myself and started making work that was for other people. Um, and so that to me is sort of, you know, the great, great pleasure. I mean, as a, with the New York Beautification Project, which where I was painting these sort of oval landscapes illegally over graffiti in New York City, one of my favorite comments, and there were a lot of great comments, was when this one boy came up to me and he said, how did you get this job? And I said, well, I, I just decided I'd do it. And he was like, how much are they paying you? And I said, nothing. He said, man, got to get a better job. <laughs> Uh, you now outlined like two aspects that um, that I consider when I think about the success of artists that we work with and how I'd like to help that happen. One is the audience side, and the other is the side of the artists themselves. Often they're uh, inextricable, but again, the point being that it does create new experiences for other people, but it also creates new experiences for the artists and their ideas and the perpetuation of their ideas. Um, I also think that you know for. For me, and again, this is where like these specific practicalities do come into play. Is I hope that by giving opportunities that don't exist in a direct, uh, an immediate uh, exchange, monetary exchange, it actually then affords the opportunity for other kinds of financial support and, and monetary exchanges that are part of the rest of the art world. I mean, again, we're all none of us are as idealistic as we like to speak about it, we all understand how things work. And frankly, if it means, if, if I do the thing that isn't saleable, but it does create uh, ideas in the world that then allow the sales to happen, just to speak 
as literal as I can be in, in the other parts of their world, that is also a way I consider uh, providing, helping to provide success for artists. I mean, again, there is still the point at which one has to pay for their lives and should be able to do so in a reasonable enough sense that they can keep their ideas being the forefront of what they're thinking. So, um, you know, I mean, nobody ever likes to talk about it. Like, as soon as we segue into the actual money moments, everybody right. starts to look at you like you're tacky and you're being sort of not, you're not speaking about the right things. But frankly, I mean, it's, it, it, bug, it bugs me. It's idiotic to not, to pretend that those things aren't realistic aspects of what we do and that, you know, that aren't part of the subjects of every conversation that's being had. So I like to think that from the idea of territorial or organizational success is being able to at least make that not be the only thing on your mind you're not talking about and or help that in the future in addition to of course what you both said about your own sides as well as the audience side. I mean we, we, we just have a few minutes a few more minutes left which before I open it up to everybody else I hope everybody has some questions brewing so you can ask these wonderful people uh, some questions uh, related to these subjects, but you know, perception also is such a powerful thing. Perception is very, very powerful and, and connecting to quote success, and this wasn't in the questions I gave you, but just just briefly, sorry, I'm, I'm going to pull this on you, but these big projects that you guys get, and also, Shamim, you can probably talk about this too from artists that you've worked with, so many artists you've worked with, at the end of the day, the, what you were talking about as far as money, people don't talk about that so much, and thus also is the reason for this book. Um, can you talk about that just briefly, even in a few of the projects that you get the reality of that, where you see that these big, big or, or uh, these uh, exhibitions in museums, for example, or uh, these big public art projects, the day to day, I mean, to you guys, it sounds absurd and crazy. I'm just as an example. Do you have a driver? Do you, you know, do you have a yacht in the corner? I mean, the, the part of this book which is really important uh, to me was to show, even though someone may be perceived, an artist may be perceived as they, they may be making millions of dollars, and when in fact all of these 40 artists are on the same page, they're all doing so much for their work that, you know, the financial aspect of it it, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, except that it gives them more freedom to, to make their work. Would you, would you, can you comment on that, or um, do you have anything to say on that? I know I didn't give you the question before. I don't have a yacht, but I do have a church. You do have a church! <laughs> so... And it's beautiful, it's in <laughs> Um... I guess the question is, is the perception really as close to reality, or is it distant? Doesn't it depend on what the perception is? I mean, it, you know, yes. and, and I think it's just so varied. Artists are human beings, so naturally they're incredibly varied. You know, some people are going to be up all hours, and other people will need a very regimented life to be able to be productive. And I think, you know, obviously you need to find out what works for you. I mean, I need a sort of mixture of order and chaos, otherwise I become extremely unhappy. But, uh, but no yacht and that's. I'm not sure I would put it, <laughs> given that I don't actually own any real estate. I think it's, it's not as um, consistent, at least not for me, in, yeah. in my life. And if I've got, in the case of the Irish Hunter Memorial, I committed two years of my life to building that pretty much full time. And, um, I, I, I managed to pull off a Whitney Biennial during that period, but, but there wasn't all that much going on outside of the thing that I was most focused on. So that year might have been a lucrative year in some ways, but I also didn't produce the kinds of things that the gallery was able to, to expand my career by selling. And so that market might have suffered as a result of the focus that I put into this public realm. Or if you do a museum exhibition, yeah, of course, there is a possibility of, of press and, and, and future sales, but the investment of time in producing that installation is all-encompassing and not there's no, there's no income directly coming in from that, perhaps for production. Well, it depends on, on the museum. That's yes. true. That's, I'm not working with the right ones. 
she made me want to call my address. Something about whatever part of the art world you work within, honestly, like artist, curator, director, it, it actually pertains in different ways, but it's, you need to have a comfort with like endless like variability and lack of consistency, as you both said. But I mean, a, a friend of mine once called it the poverty jet set, like my life was the poverty jet set, because it would go from like whatever the janky ass hotel that I'm staying at right now, but then the, the dinner I went to on the yacht yesterday, oh, or whatever, wow. you know what I mean? But then the artist you get to do something truly like special for, um, with money as well as with opportunity, to the moment where you say like, I'm sorry, you have to give me everything for free and you have to do everything for free yourself. So it's like day to day, I'm different. It, it honestly is, and like the, the best goal is that it evens out on a whole. And, because, and, and that to me is at the end of the day what I think is the most important way of thinking about the creative endeavor is that none of it is about the immediate, if everything is like a one-to-one, -one, like did I get this for that? Did I get is the zero sum appropriate in this case? You're not gonna be successful. That would be not successful to me. Like thinking about if everything accumulates to the best case scenario, to getting your things done over time and your ideas out over time and your your effect done over time, um, that's successful to me. And it requires that comfort with your ability for everybody. Right. And there is a perception that some people have. And I suppose there's some people who do have like a constantly charmed life. But I'm just saying, like whatever you think about. It, even like a very, very well-renowned artist or curator or so on, it's just not that way all the time. That's great. So uh, I would love to open questions, and then I also want to just mention there are a few contributors here in the audience that aren't up on stage, but there's Michael Wall is right here, and Amy Pleasant is here, I believe, right there. And I'm not sure if Amanda Church is here, she is and Brian Avotny. So they're all here too and talk to you afterwards about their perceptions and their essays are in this book as well. But let's take some questions from anyone who might have any questions to start. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Oh, not at all. There's a microphone coming to you so we can hear you. Go ahead. So we are here in Art Basel, but we have visited you yeah. come to me. Like, no, no, I don't want to see you. Okay. Do we have here at Basel? Yes. But I visited many things. I just come from an entire town. And I made an offer. I saw a printing that was nice. That was $4,500. Yes. Immediately they asked me, oh, can you make us an offer? I mean, this gentleman spoke of the seven million and a half project. This right. lady seems successful. There are millions of artists who really suffer. What do you think? How do they make it up? These people right. seem to be Right, that's what I, what I was talking about, perception. Okay, so, so this lovely woman... Can you repeat what she's been saying? Pardon me? I am going to repeat it right now. These lovely people, <laughs> this lovely woman had just mentioned that uh, she just, and I'm paraphrasing that big question, that she just saw a painting for $4,500 at, was an untitled art fair? And that she had mentioned that Brian did a project for seven million dollars, and that Ellen seems to be successful, as you mentioned. You know, what about all the other artists who are maybe grinding it out, and you know, maybe not quote successful? That's why we were talking about that. I still, I want to respond to that first before I give it to them. I hope you don't mind. But in this book, there are many artists who don't have those opportunities. But also, I would venture to guess that Brian's seven million dollar project. A lot of that was towards the project. If he had $7 million, he'd have that yacht on the, uh, on the Hudson River. Uh, so I think that the measure of success is continuing that creativity, and the perception is these prices that are going for, uh, of pieces are going for so much money. The reality is that we don't know where that, what's behind that. Also the fabrication materials that go behind, and also all of the other pieces that have been sold or not sold to that point of the artist. You know, they haven't been sold. They've been making work for many, many years. They've been borrowing money for many years, and maybe it's just that one piece for forty five hundred dollars that then that's in that pocket. That person goes against that that uh, debt that they put put it into the work. So I think perception is very, very uh, powerful in that way. And. Money necessarily is not necessarily the equivalent to showing how successful an artist is. Can you guys comment on that? I, 
you look, okay, I mean, two things. One, yes, there is clearly a market discrepancy between certain amounts of money that people are making at this time, and that's absolutely true. On one hand, in the entirely commercial venture. However, I can't repeat enough how unclear it is, I think, to most people that um, a project that's done beautifully is largely done that way because the people who are the most intrinsic to the project, primarily the artist, maybe secondarily the, the curator, their producers, the people who fabricate, people who give everything, they're the ones who make the least out of it. And I can say this with 100% certainty because I do these budgets and I ask the artists to do that. Now, if had I my druthers, I would give them all the money I had in the world, but if there's no option to do it without the only person who has to be there taking the least money. It's ironic, but it's the way that it normally works. So the seven million dollars to which Brian refers, I think more, mostly he meant as, as that type of irony, that more often than not, those kinds of projects, when Lexus sponsors a gala for us, the people who don't get the money are the artists who donated the work that made the gala possible and made it fancy enough for them to give us the money. And I'm not saying I, I, I think it's correct, but I do want to, I do want everyone to be aware of that. Those the people who think that that's not the case, the person who is still getting the least out of it, whether their work seems to be selling for a huge amount or a, a low amount, is always the artists, and then maybe secondarily the not for profit behind them. And it's not, you know, there are some exceptions without a doubt. The general structure is that, and mostly. Again, like correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my understanding is that you were saying this seems like this extraordinary huge thing, and yes, it was for you intellectually and in terms of the commitment yes. of your ideas. Yes, but as for far as the amount of money that I've been I don't think your point was that you just flew out a whole no. bunch of cash out of your no. house. Do you have the driver and yet from that project? No, no. I didn't. Well, well, here's the thing the demographic that makes up the art community is as varied as the people who look at it, is as varied as the people who buy it. Right? Some of you have billions. Some of you have billions. Or those who don't buy it. No. Some of us, I was born into a very middle class family. Some artists are born into quite wealthy families. But it's, the thing is, we all commit ourselves to ideas. And we commit ourselves to advancing art. And, and that's our choice. And why shouldn't I be successful? I work very hard for my money. So when people come to me and say things like you did, ma'am, I take offense because we here work on the idea that we are going to contribute something to, to society and to culture. And the fact that I shouldn't be rewarded for it commercially is absurd and offensive. But I, do, I, do think it's a, I, do, I do think it's a good question, though, because you're saying, what about all the other artists? And no, it's not that I said this gentleman but I, I think I understand your point, and I... Why don't you speak right. into the mic so we can all hear what you have to say? That's all right, she doesn't want to do that. Okay, let me take a question behind here. Yes, right behind here. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm really curious about, there's the artists, and there's the curators, but then there's also the collectors, and I think, like a budget, you know, there's expense and then the income. And we're not really talking very much about um, the collectors that do make it possible, the people that are putting the money for the projects forward. And I'm just wondering if you guys could maybe highlight an example where a collector or a patron is kind of championing that side and, and inspiring other people to also pay it forward and continue to pay it forward. Shamim, do you want to speak on that first? Do you mind? Yeah, no, no, I don't at all. I mean, um, philanthropic commitment, which I think all of, you know, again, to support your point, Brian, all of us already have by doing what we do. There's still not a commitment from the collector and funder position. Now, I, from an individual collector, I think there's a little bit more about their own commitment. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna speak specifically to private individuals versus say a corporation or so on, which has a lot of other reasons to be happening. Um, there are private individuals who have who truly do this as a way to advance the ideas that they believe in. That is the way that they can contribute. So the artist can contribute an idea, a developmental, like a, a, a way of experiencing the world. Let's, uh, hopefully a not-for-profit organization and a curator can help 
make that happen and translate it. And their contribution can be giving you the, the currency, the literal currency, to make that happen. Everybody has a part of a, 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 a component of that currency in the total group. And I think that they, the, the best collectors I know, think of themselves as being one part of that organism. Um, I've had a number of situations, um, it's probably an easy one, Phil and Shirley Ahrens, for example, have on numerous occasions when I was at the Whitney, when I was not able to afford doing a scholarly catalog for young artists, which they feel very committed to, uh, were willing to help make that happen purely to document the ideas that for posterity, not let it just happen and, and disappear, which can sometimes be the case, especially given how much happens in this day-to-day uh, -day scenario. So don't get me wrong, there are plenty of people who commit on a, 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 lot, on a lot of different levels, just that I'm sitting with artists here, so I want to make it clear that they're always the first and foremost to make that sacrifice. But there are plenty of other people who make this organism work. Um, and that kind of pure, I mean, pure is the wrong word, but that kind of dedicated philanthropy, I guess I should say, is uh, utterly critical to make it happen. And they should be equivalently recognized for it. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes there's a lot of other reasons people do things, and they're not all uh, with that kind of integrity. It's so maybe. We're going to take one more question. Buzz, Buzz Spector is an artist who lives in St. Louis. This is worse than St. Louis. But Thanks for the shout out, Sharon. <laughs> uh, I've been at this a, a long time as a working artist, and uh, one of the things I'd like to hear you speak to briefly in this last section is, is benchmarking. We we don't go from sale to sale or from project to project. We we have plans that we follow, sometimes going years into the future, sometimes hypothetical rather than practical. And I'd love to hear how you speak to that. Ellen, can you start with that? Um, I have to admit to being practically unfamiliar with the term benchmarking, but and I have to say that I, I wish I wish I had a plan. Um, I can think of nothing more delightful and impressive. But in fact, I don't have a plan. Um, I sort of bounce from opportunity to opportunity. Um, my studio is full of an enormous list of possible, impossible, utterly impossible projects that I would like to do. And, and then as opportunities present themselves, either you know, with my galleries, or with institutions, or with public projects, um, then I should look at that list and think, can I do one of those? Or do I have to, need to come up with a new idea? And often I end up coming up with a new idea. So I, I can feel at the end that I sort of float through the world and an enormous um, kind of body of things that I would like to make happen. That I would love to see in the world. That's what waking you know, I wake up in the morning thinking, I wonder if I can persuade anyone to do this. You know? And sometimes it happens. I, I just persuaded some people in, in Belgium to ruin a church. It was I couldn't believe it. And I felt kind of <laughs> cheap myself. <laughs> How could this have happened? Not Brian's church. <laughs> Not Brian's yeah, beautiful church. <laughs> Before I her up this, you know. But yeah, yeah. ever since then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I, but I think that, yes, I think artists do have, you do have, you do have things that you would like to do. And then there's what life offers you. And sometimes life doesn't offer you very much at times. And sometimes life offers you a tremendous amount. And I think one of the things, you know, in, in talking about success, I think it's extremely important to remember that as an artist, you have to always remember that Maybe, maybe it will work out, or maybe it won't at the end. You have to, you know, your work is the thing that sustains you. There are people who are remarkable artists um, who, who never get much recognition. And there are people, you know, the art world is quite as far from a perfect meritocracy. And I think as an artist, to sustain yourself emotionally, you both have to think about what you would like to do. And recognize that you may not get to do any of it. Maybe you end up having to do something else. And that's part of you know, the risk. Of, of what we do. Um, but, but can I also add too that, and we're going to have to close soon, but I should also add that you never know too, as far as timing, when that dialogue will occur between the work and the public at any given venue, at any given circumstance. So I think there, 
there, that also has to be said too, that uh, it's unpredictable. Um, but I, I have to close actually, you have to be less than, less than a paragraph. Sentence, sentence. Benchmarks. Um, I, I don't set big benchmarks and I agree with Noah, it's very, very difficult to predict what the next thing is going to be. So you have to be very, very flexible as an artist to be able to respond to the situations as they present themselves. But there are benchmarks for each project along the way. And we have to keep very, very close tabs. And we need support systems to be able to maintain the budgets, hire the correct architects, etc. There's lots of benchmarks that have to factor into a successful project. But I don't think we can look at it as a kind of forecast into the future. Short enough? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so before I go, I just want to say that um, this book, book is going to be in its third printing starting Monday. And it has not, thank you, and it has, it has not uh, been on the bookshelves except for MoMA. There's only two copies left at MoMA and here. This is it. They're with me and in here. That's it. So if anybody would like to take advantage of purchasing this book and reading these stories that these artists have given and shared to everyone, please come here and purchase a book here and have these wonderful people and these other contributors sign them and talk with them right now. Thank you very, very much for being here. I look forward to continuing the conversation.